Okay. Hey, welcome everybody uh, to this permitting class. You know, as you all know, permitting is just the, you know, one of the foundations of the whole um, national flood insurance program. And so it's, it's crucially important. And I hopefully that we'll, hopefully we'll have some, um, some good things to share today with you. Hopefully you'll get a lot out of it. Now we're ready to get started then. This is uh, Permitting with Confidence. And this is me. This is my little I love me slide. Um, but uh, they always say it's important for me to tell you why it is you ought to be listening to me. I, I am a certified floodplain manager. I got my master's degree with the National Graduate School. I've got a Bachelor of Science in Education and a Bachelor of Science in Education uh, in Mathematics from Peru State College, go Bobcats. And I am the outreach coordinator for the Nebraska Department of Natural Resources. So here we have the, the new, I, I say new, it's been about, it's been nearly four years now that this has been out, but it's our model floodplain development permit, ap permit application. Uh, I, I think there should be a slash there because it is an application until you sign it. And then it can be the actual permit that you're giving them. Those copies are available online. You can see the link down below. And I imagine that Michelle is going to be putting the link out in the chat if she hasn't already. Oh, I didn't plan on it, but everybody received a copy via email. Anyway. Oh, good. There you go. <laughs> nice. Thanks. She rocks, I tell you. It is generic, but you will notice um, on the one that she sent you or on the link, there's a little space up there in that where you see the space now. Uh, they've got a little symbol there where you can go on ahead and you can put in your own community's branding. So if you have some logo for your community, uh, you can put it up there. And that's nice. Uh, this application does not account for cumulative improvement regs. So if you have... Uh, regulations dealing with cumulative improvements, then you could tweak this. We could certainly get you a, uh, we, we might have it in Word, but whatever version we have it in that you could edit, uh, you can feel free to edit this. Again, there's no requirement that you use a certain type of permit um, in Nebraska. And many of you deal with the highway department, maybe most of your permits come from road work that the highway department is doing. And you'll notice that they have their own permit that they send you. You can accept that permit. You can go ahead and sign that application and use it as a permit for them. I do know of communities and counties that send them this form and they say, hey, you know, we appreciate your permit, but we, in our county, in our community, in our jurisdiction, we require that you use this form. And, um, uh, the Department of Roads, Department of Transportation, they, 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 they've been willing to do that. So, uh, so don't feel bad about standing up to the state of Nebraska and saying, "Hey, you know, I, I am Nebraska City, right, Marty?" And uh, and make them follow through. So, why, why all of this? Um, well, floodplains are hazardous areas. In the state of Nebraska, and Nebraska means is an Indian name meaning flat water, which we might as well just say flood water, you know, because that's, that's how it got flat and wide everywhere. Uh, it's a land of many waters. And uh, so flooding is, is a major uh, disaster in the state of Nebraska. And when you look at, if you talk to your emergency manager, and if you look at the local uh, emergency operation plan, you'll see flooding listed in every county, I believe, except two. And I don't know what they both are. I think Perkins is one of them. But I think other uh, Perkins and one other county, other than that, every county has it listed as, as one of the uh, worst disasters for your county. And it certainly is on the state emergency operation plan listed as one of the the, the biggest, the largest hazards uh, in the state of Nebraska. And when you think about it, that makes sense. 
you know, we have tornadoes and they're, they're terrible. A ten, tornado hits the city and you've got a lot of devastation. But we get a lot of tornadoes, but not a whole lot of them hit a city. Um, and, uh, and, yet, and yet when we have a flood, there's usually lots of property damage, lots of crop damage, lots of houses that get damaged. There's usually somebody that decides to drive their pickup truck along the flood over the floodwaters and they get washed down. So we, we typically have an actual death, you know, so you can see why it is a, a major disaster here. So because of that, regulations have been adopted at your local level um, to go on ahead and and regulate how we develop in the floodplain in this high risk area. Uh, of course, any place can flood. So just because we have it identified as a high risk area doesn't mean that there aren't other places that would be at risk for flooding, but we're trying to focus on this one area that we know if we have this event go on, um, that, that we're gonna have damage in this area. And for our two people that are, that are here from, from the RV park, uh, RV park developments. I want to let you know, we call it sometimes the 100 year flood or the one out of 100 chance flood or the 1% chance flood. But the, but the idea is, is when you work on um, statistics that way, during a 30 year mortgage of a typical house or a 30 year mortgage of your campground, you have a one out of four chance that during that 30 year span, there's going to be a flood going through there. And that's pretty high. You've got a one out of 10 chance that your office is going to have a fire. And yet, of course, you would want to have fire insurance. So uh, one out of four chances is, is a very good chance. So, uh, so the risk is rather high within the floodplain. So... Nebraska regulations say sufficient data and maps uh, that the that the local government will be provided with maps showing these floodplains, and uh, that it's the responsibility of the local government to adopt, administer, and to enforce a floodplain management plan regulations which meet our minimum standards. Um, and it also is a requirement for if. You need to be in the flood insurance program for you to obtain federally backed flood insurance. And flood insurance, if, if there's a house in the floodplain, if there's a mortgage on it, that bank is going to require flood insurance. And so that, that's a pretty big carrot uh, to have out there. If the community doesn't do their permitting, if they don't hold up their end of the deal as far as the National Flood Insurance Program, if they don't enforce their ordinance, then they could be removed from the flood insurance program. And that would mean that all those people that have um, mortgages on their houses or whatever, um, or on their campground, uh, they have loans there and the bank is requiring them to have flood insurance, that federal flood insurance won't be available. So the development is managed according to the local floodplain ordinance. I get a lot of questions uh, from citizens about floodplain regulations and and Becky, Shane, Marty, uh, Justin, when I get those calls, I let them know that I can only tell them about the generic kind of rules that each community might have higher standards. And I give them your name and telephone number and I tell them to go ahead and contact uh, the local floodplain administrator to find out what regulations they're gonna to need to follow and to make sure that they get a permit. Because all of this is at the local level. At the state level, you have to build so that your structures are a foot higher than the base flood elevation. But I happen to know that in Cass County, you have to build two feet higher. Because again, it's not based, uh, your individual development isn't based on our regs, it's based on your local ordinance. That's where you have the authority. Any development in the special flood hazard area must have written permission or a floodplain development permit to
to commence. They have to have it before the work starts. So what is development? Well, development is just about anything. It means any man-made changes to improved or unimproved real estate. And we could probably just stop there. But as an example, you know, the, the thing is, it's, it's not just limited to building a house or building a, or, or building a, a barn or a grain bin or a business. Uh, again, you, you, you two that came here with RV parts, I'm going to be calling you out through the whole thing. But, you know, all the things that you're trying to do and develop there, it, it all needs a permit. Putting the road on in there. Uh, is going to need a permit. How is that going to affect the floodwaters? Is that road going to back up floodwater and maybe flood uh, an adjacent property owner's house or or some or knock out some infrastructure? Um, so so anything, any development, and that could in, include any kind of earthwork that you're doing, grading, dredging, um, paving, excavation, uh, burying cables, burying pipeline. Uh, for you folks with the RV parks. My recommendation is when you go to get that permit, you bring the whole scope of your project to them so that so that you're getting one permit for everything that you're doing rather than having to go up for each individual thing that you're doing, a different permit for the road, a different permit for the shower house and the like. Bring the whole package to them at once and look for permitting for the overall project. Well, this is what the permit looks like. It's a... Um, page front and back or two pages, however uh, you want to look at it. And with that, there's very little that the floodplain administrator is actually supposed to be filling in. Uh, the floodplain administrator can fill that top portion out, putting in the permission, the permit number. If there's a fee, there's a, there's a box for it, uh, dates, um, the receipt number for that fee, whether it's approved, you know, this is an application, was this approved or not? And um, and the date that that's decided, any notes there. And then, as we said, after the permit is acceptable, then the permit, then the floodplain administrator signs it, signs the application, and it becomes a permit. So we're going to be talking about a whole lot of things here in the permit for you to be looking at when it's turned in, the actual responsibility for that, and again, that's one of the reasons why. I... All right, so let's start going through this. We talked a little bit about the part that you filled up up in the top right-hand corner, but this first section here is just the part where the, where the developer is going to fill this out. And... As you can see, there's a place for the owner's name and address, but you know, the owner's name and address might be different than where they're actually building the structure. They could live in town, they could be building a house out in the country. So the structures or the development address might be completely different. It might be that they don't even have an address yet and all they have is a, a lot number or maybe all they have is section township range. And all of that, either of those could be filled in in that last box. And it could be that the owner has an address, the structure has an address, but the actual contractor that's doing this and applying for this permit has a separate address themselves. And if that's the case, you can see they've got all of that plus a line for their license number. And that's kind of important because when they fill out their license number, it kind of lets them know it's important because you know? <laughs> they're putting their lights, they're putting their number, they're putting their uh, their their job, their reputation um, right there on the line. The next section, you can see there's a, there's a lot to it, but that's because we we tried to fill out everything to make it easier for them to fill out. Uh, essentially, all I've got to do is put a check, mark, uh, a check mark in the right box, so you don't have to try and figure out what kind of project type we're looking for. Is this a residential or is this a non-residential? Are you just building walls around something uh, that could be an obstruction? To um, and it, I know it says fence, 
And many of you have called me about fences. You know, do we need to have a permit for fence? You know, if it's a privacy fence, that's essentially a wall. Uh, yeah, I would think that you'd need to have a permit for that. Um, if it's uh, three strands of barbed wire, that's a gray area that I'll let you guys decide on whether you are going to require a permit for something like that or not. Um, is it new construction? Is this uh, is a, a, a detached garage or maybe it's new construction like an attached garage? Maybe all they're doing is earthwork. Maybe they're just hauling a, a mobile home on in or something like that. Maybe it's a, a rehab. So they can just check one of those. All of those, of course, uh, have different regulations. And if you're wondering, okay, well, I wish you'd go through all the regulations that we need to cover with each one of these, then please attend my uh, four-hour basic class. And I'll be having that in June probably. But the good news is, make this plug now and I'll make it at the end too, we are going to be doing it live in Grand Island. It's going to be a marvelous class. Broken it's, bow. Oh, broken bow. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you saved me over and over again. Yeah, uh, in broken bow. And it's going to be a marvelous class. It's going to be a two-day event. Uh, but you can just attend the first day, which is when I go over the basics. And then in the afternoon, we cover a variety of different topics. But day two of that is when we bring in all of these other people. Becky, you know this. You've, you've We've had this conversation before. I've got these blinders on where I talk about floodplain regulations, but we all know you can't sign this permit until you get all the other permits you need. Well, what other permits? Well, it could be endangered species. It could be wetlands. It could be septic. It could be all of these other things that I don't deal with, but you as community officials, you do deal with. And on the second day, that's when we bring in all of these people from the Nebraska Department of uh, Environment and Energy. We bring in people from uh, United uh, U.S. Corps of Engineers, um, from FEMA, talking about grant money and things like that. All of these other entities that, as a floodplain administrator, you work with, and it's a and it's a great day. And if you're thinking, my little community just doesn't have the money to send me to a two-day event like that and put me up for the night, Michelle, do you want to tell them the good news? dealing with communities that just don't have the money? Yeah, most definitely. So FEMA has improved grant funding for Nebraska floodplain administrators to receive a reimbursement for travel-related expenses. So, of course, all of our trainings are free. But often that hotel, the mileage, the meals, a lot of the communities, you know, just can't swing that. And their budgets are done. You know, you had to submit your budget, you know, January of last year for this year and that wasn't on the budget. So we have the funding available. Please use it. Please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I have to fill out like 20 extra forms if we don't use the funds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There you go. Help us spend our money. There you yeah. go. So if you would like to come to that two-day event, but you just don't think that your community can afford it, it's not in your community's budget, then, uh, then you've got Michelle's email address and, uh, you can go ahead and contact her and say, you know, give me more information about the scholarship, which is also that that information is right on the registration too, isn't it, Michelle? It is. Yeah. And I think everybody has received it in probably three different forms by now. So they uh, haven't got uh, it by mail. It went by Gov for delivery. And then I sent an email. So it, yeah. it's been advertised. <laughs> all right. So there you go. So if you want to know more about the regulations, dealing with all of those, uh, there you have it. And and of course, after they put a check in the checkbox, then they can just describe the work. You know, it's a it's a remodel rehab. And there they can, you know, because that that's a certain uh, group of regulations that you're going to be dealing with, or this is grading. But then in the description, they can say, hey, I'm making a bunch of mounds for a motocross track right along the river. Or Richard can say, you know, we're smoothing things out because, you um, because we're going to be putting slabs in for for RVs and uh, and drive-throughs and the like. So you know you can go ahead and, and describe it better there. Now this next section, cost of improvement, appraised value, and the, the calculation, and is this a substantial improvement? Um, this is a whole other class that we go through, but 
I can sum it all up right now. If you are doing improvements to your house or to your garage or to whatever structure it is, if, if you're just doing some improvements, then it still needs to be permitted, but that's an easy thing to do. If you are improving more than 50%, FEMA doesn't consider that to be an improvement. That's more than half the value of the structure. They consider that to be a rebuild. And if this house that's that's having an addition built on or something like that, if they were built, well, let's just cut to the cut to the chase. Uh, um, if if uh, if this is grandfathered, then if they're going to do more than fifty percent improvements, then they have to bring the whole thing into compliance with the ordinance. So if they're just doing less than fifty percent. They can put a little addition on. They can even put a basement under it, as long as it's no deeper than the basement that already exists. But if it's more than 50%, they're going to have to take this grandfathered structure and bring the whole thing into compliance with your ordinance. And that's what this is talking about. It's saying, you know, what's the cost of the improvement? What's the value of the structure? And then we have this stupid little formula there. You can look at it and say, yeah, is the cost more than half of the of the value, you know, but that's that's what we're getting at. Is is it more than 50%? If so, then yes, it's a substantial improvement. If no, then it is not a substantial improvement. Uh, let's see. It's also important to note that uh, this is the same kind of, this is a section you're gonna be filling out quite a bit after a disaster, right, Becky? I mean, after 2019, you probably had a ton of these that you were filling out, right? So, um, so oh, I'm sorry, you're muted. Luckily, no, I did not have very many. Enough, <laughs> but nice. Nice. minimal, minimal. Right, but some of you are, are floodplain administrators for a small village or something like that that just doesn't do a whole lot of permitting but then a disaster comes through and all of those houses that were built before 1976 you know they all get damaged and they all need repair and you're gonna have to have a permit for each one of those you'd have to decide with each one of those was it damaged more than 50 percent uh same same rule would apply All right, so then what flood zone is it in? And this deals with map reading, which you know we, we talk about in our basic class. But I think most of you people that are on here, you, you understand what flood zones you have, whether you have an A zone, an AE zone, an AO zone, or something along that line. Um, so here, the majority of the floodplains we have in Nebraska are A or AE, uh, or maybe a shaded X. And the only time you would be doing that is if you're one of those communities that regulate in the shaded X, maybe you regulate the development of critical facilities. The shaded X is the one out of 500 um, floodplain, one out of 500 chance floodplain. Not regulatory, but some of you say, you know, we don't allow critical facilities, so we still need a permit for it. If it's one of those others, AO, AH, A99, um, Becky, on yours, because you've got about a thousand million killion different zones, you could just circle AE if it's a numbered A zone. You know, you wouldn't have to you wouldn't have to put A7 or A16. I mean, you could. You could go on ahead and they could put other, but uh, but essentially all of those are just an archaic form of an AE zone. Then the base flood elevation, how, you know, in that particular area, what do we calculate that one out of a hundred chance elevation of the flood water to be? And then most of you for that required flood protection elevation, most of you would have one foot higher than the base flood elevation. And in Cass County, they would have two foot higher. In Lincoln and Lancaster County, they would have two foot higher. Um, so some of you have higher standards there. So that's why it doesn't just automatically say out of foot. Is the property within the flood way? Um, you folks from the RV parks, this is very important. In Nebraska, in an AE zone, 
typically in Nebraska. There are maybe three or four communities statewide that have an AE zone that does not have a floodway. But typically in the state of Nebraska, if you have an AE zone, there'll be a floodway designated, this red area going through the middle of the floodplain. You cannot have any structure or human habitation in the floodway. Now, I imagine you, you're kind of saying, you know, Richard, you're probably saying, oh my goodness, no, 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 no RVs in there. RVs aren't structures. Now, it could very well be that the county says, we don't care whether they're structures or not. We're not letting you have anything in there for human habitation. And they certainly have the authority to say that. But you can go ahead and have slabs typically uh, in there because an RV isn't a structure, um, but no structures for human habitation. So that means if you have some, some other uh, structure there, uh, maybe you have all of these uh, RV slabs, but then you have some like permanent yurts uh, that are there year round. Well, those can't be in the floodway. And what's more is any development that you do in the floodway, even if it's just earthwork, but certainly if you're going to put your shower house there or something like that, anything that's done in the floodway, you have to have an engineer letter that says that this will not cause any rise at all. Any work you do in the, in the floodway, you have to have a no rise certificate. This letter from an engineer or an architect that says, this development that they're going to do here in the floodway isn't going to cause any rise. All right. So where do you find the, B, the BFE? Well, if, if you're looking for a BFE, of course, you guys being the floodplain administrators, you guys know that you can request it from DNR if you're in an A zone. If, you're, if it's an AH zone, which is ponding, you'll see it right on the firm itself. It'll say the base flood elevation is 1253 or something along that line. If it's in an AO, then which is sheet flooding, it'll say sheet flooding with, for, with a depth of two feet. AO zone, uh, they, they'll call it a, AO2 or an AO zone with a depth of three or one or something like that. So with that, the base flood elevation is just whatever that number is plus whatever the highest adjacent grade is, whatever the HAG is. So that's something that can just be, um, that a surveyor can come up with out in the field. With an AE zone or an AE with floodway, those are both calculated from the FIS. Now, in order to do that, uh, you would go to our interactive maps, No rise guidance. Had that one out of uh, had that one out of order. Okay, so here we go. Um, in an A in an A zone, when you make that request, this is what you'll get. You'll get one of these uh, maps of your area. One of these aerials. You'll see all those squiggly lines, and you see that yellow box that I've got there, right in between fifteen fifty six and fifteen fifty seven. If that's where the structure is being built then you look at those two elevations and you pick the higher of the two. So for that building there, if that's where the proposed building site is, their base flood elevation would be 1557. Now these, are, um, these aren't uh, done in an AE zone unless you request them. And as the floodplain administrator, you're the only one that can request them. Now we're gonna go through this one rather quick because I've been going through this kind of slow and I see that I've got 15 minutes to wrap this up and I don't want to go late. So we're going to go through at least one of these examples here, but in an AE zone, you see all of these lines all over the place. And so when you go to our interactive map, what you'll see then is just a few lines. You'll see these cross section lines. Uh, you see over there on the far left, there's a little arrow that says AA, uh, you see up at the top, there's a letter, there's a cross section, that line that's labeled A, and you'll see on over there on the right, a line that's labeled Z. And I've got two little red structures that I've got in there uh, to calculate. And we'll start with this one here. 
Now, what I can do is um, I can go ahead and I can turn on all of these other base flood elevations, all of these squiggly kind of insurance lines. And they give me an idea of, of how to come up with the, the area that's perpendicular to this structure. So I can go on ahead and I can draw a line from this, from where this, um, where this building site is going to be to the, to the flood source, to that river. And then after I do that, I can go on ahead and I can turn that measuring tool on, on our interactive map. You see that icon up there at the top and, um, and I, I switch it on over to US feet. And then you can see over there on the left, I've measured where to the part that corresponds, the part of the river that corresponds to my structure. And now I can go on ahead and I can measure just by clicking all along, following that river and clicking until I get on over there to that line that was marked AA. Now it's very important at this point for me to realize, uh, for, for me to recognize that I was going from Z to AA. And I'm gonna stress this a lot as I go over this. Now, this will seem complicated and it only seems complicated because it's complicated, but it's not difficult, okay? I could teach an eighth grader to do this. It's a lot of steps involved, but it's not difficult. So. We go on ahead and we find that space, the course of that place that corresponds to the to the flood source, to whatever that flood source is, and we measure to the closest uh, line that we can come up to come up with, in this case AA, and then we go to the flood insurance study, which you probably have as a book somewhere collecting dust dust in your uh, in your file cabinet, but you can also get this online um, at the FEMA's, at FEMA's Map Service Center, the MSC. And if you don't know how to get to FEMA's Map Service Center, just do a Google search, type in FEMA, F-E-M-A, -F -E and then put a space and put M-S-C, and it'll be your first choice. And you pull up your community, you go to your community and you look at, uh, at your, your um, at, at the different products you have for your community. And one of those will be the flood insurance study, might be called the FIS, flood insurance study. So you go to your FIS, and in the back, there are all of these profiles. And you find the profile for the particular flooding source. In this case, we're looking at Shell Creek. We know that it's Shell Creek, okay? And so what I do is down here at the bottom, are you seeing my, my, my little arrow? Okay, down here at the bottom, I find AA. I also look down here and I see that um, that every one of these dark lines here, it's 2,000 feet from one to the next. That means each one of these little boxes is 200 feet because there's 10 of them. Now remember, I'm going from, uh, I'm measuring from AA towards Z. That's what I'm going in, in between. So, so it's the distance from wherever my structure is and I'm measuring on over to AA and it seemed to me like, what do we have, 1400 or something like that? Let me zoom back to where we measured that. I've got 1200, so 1200, you see that? Where I measured it and it was 1200. Okay. So that means six of these little boxes. And so from this line here, I go back one, two, three, four, five, six, and I come on up here. The 100 year flood is always gonna be a dash, dot, dot, dash, dot, dot, dash, dot, dot. And so I take that all the way on up here and I find where that crosses. And I follow that over here to the side. I can see that each one of these boxes here is uh, twin, is 10 feet, and that's a 40 there, is, uh, is 10 feet. So that means each one of these is a foot, and I'm going up one, two, three foot. So I know that the base flood elevation for that structure is going to be 1533. Just a matter of reading the chart calculating things on over. Again, there's a lot of steps to it, but it's not really difficult. 
It's just a matter of reading the chart. Now, this isn't the only way that we could have done this. Let me muddy the water a little bit. There are also things that are that are out there like this particular highway. And I can measure from this same spot over to the highway. And when I do that, you'll notice that these highway bridges here are already shown on here. And so in this particular case, we can measure from the highway on over, which I did. And then I didn't bother. Once again, I didn't bother writing that down. Uh, it looks like, oops, went back too far, didn't I? There we go. 321 feet. So a little over 300 feet. And so from here, each one of these, again, was, was 200. So I go 200, 300, about right there, right where it's crossing this line here, which turns out to be the very same line. So 15, 33. And you'll notice it's possible to look at this and to interpolate in between here. Let's say that, we'd, that we had come to this spot right here. Well, that's not quite halfway through this little one foot box there. I could call that 1533.4. I could call that 1533.3. You know, you can look at it and you can make that kind of interpolation yourself on how far between the two you say that it's that so you say that it's gone as long as it something that makes sense. Okay. So anyway, that's just a close-up of that. All right. So now I wanted to talk about this house up here. Now, this looks pretty weird because I don't know what the flood source is. Is it this river down here or is it this river up here? Am I measuring from this A line to the Z line? Am I measuring from this A line to the AA line? Uh, you know, what am I what, what am I corresponding to this one here? Everything's sort of spinning around. So once again, I go on over here at, in this in this particular uh, uh, layers menu. I can turn back on those insurance lines that we're not supposed to use for calculating elevations, but they're just used for, they used to be used for insurance rating. But I can turn them on because when I turn them on, it shows me wh what, uh, what flood source I'm looking at. In this particular case, I lucked out. A line went right through there. Okay. And I can see that in this particular case, these lines are all dealing with this particular river here. And these lines up here are all dealing with this particular river. So I know which one that I'm that I'm uh, that I'm measuring to. And my Coming down here, I can see that I'm going from this Z line toward the railroad bridge. And so here I can go ahead and I can do my measurement. I see that I'm 1,400 feet from the railroad bridge. So here is that bridge and I'm going toward, I'm going uh, from Z toward double A going ahead and I make that measurement and I find out that um, zooming in a bit that I end up right here and right here again we're going to do some interpolation uh let's see Connie is your mic working I'm calling on you because there's two of you there can you unmute yourself there you go I can hear you hot dog okay Okay. What would you call that? Two of you can talk it on over. What would you call that? Right there. What would, would I call? call it? Well, I think that we would call it um, fifteen twenty nine point something. I wouldn't say that's gone. I wouldn't say that's halfway through the box. I don't I know if it's that much. It's like three quarters almost through the box. Okay. So. I don't know, 15, 
Well, it's just going to be one decimal. So, one so decimal. Again, it's just it's just in this in this little box here. Are we? We're less than halfway, so we're less than 0.5, right? It is less. Yeah, yeah. it's probably so it would be point, point one, two point at one. the most. Point one, one point or two. two. Yeah. If one of you said, well, I measure from the top of the line and I'm going to call it point 0.3, I wouldn't have a problem with that, you know, but somewhere, somewhere in there. Exactly. And I think any of those would be a correct answer. And the correct answer, by the way, Connie, is whatever the one you yeah. come up with. <laughs> and as far as I'm concerned. OK, yeah. but okay. someone comes on in and they've done this permit themselves. You want to be able to double check this and make sure that the answer that they gave you for the base flood elevation makes sense that it's something that's reasonable okay okay so that's how we do it now it's easy to get flipped i want to point this out you'll notice here that there is a railroad and there is a highway and going from z toward a from z toward mm -hmm. a that first there comes the railroad bridge then the highway bridge and if you look up here even FEMA, even the engineers that made this map made that mistake and flipped them around. It's just that easy. So when you're doing this, always make sure that you're logging in where you're measuring from, where you're going toward. Okay. So anyway, that's just a close up version of what I just said. All right. So then what's required? Well, this is back to the back to our permit again. Does the structure need to be elevated or is, are they going to do an accessory structure or maybe they're going to vent it? Um, maybe it's a non-residential structure and they're going to flood proof it. They can choose any one of those that they're going to be doing. Are you going to require an elevation certificate, a, a pre-construction elevation certificate from them? You're always going to require an elevation certificate or at least something from a surveyor at the end of the project showing that they complied with your ordinance. But here, this is talking about, are you going to require an elevation certificate before they begin work based on construction drawings? Is this going to be flood proofed? Are they going to elevate it or are they going to flood proof it? If they're going to flood proof it, are they going to wet flood proof it with vents? Or are they going to dry flood proof it? Um, and then what are the, what's their plan for the lowest floor elevation? And what's their elevation for their lowest HVAC equipment. That's kind of important for insurance purposes, by the way. Uh, they, they give a pretty good discount for making sure that your uh, HVAC is, is elevated with that new risk rating 2.0. If they have an enclosed area, how many square feet, how many openings, and how many total square inches? And that's important because if they're venting it, if they're wet flood proofing, then um, they have to have one square inch of opening for every square foot. If they're not wet flood proofing, you can just NA all of that. If they're elevating or if they're dry flood proofing, none of that makes any difference. You can just put an NA in each one of those boxes, or they can. And then here we go. What's the rest of the stuff that you're going to require from them? What are they going to give you? I would I would expect... You know, Richard, I would expect if you're coming on in for a permit, you're going to be handing them a site plan. This is what our campground is going to look like. This is this is the plan that we've got for all the stuff that we're doing. So a site plan uh, is certainly something that you're going to require from them to go along with this permit. Um, uh, possibly a location map. You know, where is this in my county? Uh, maybe a grading plan, uh, floor plans if it's a house or something along that line. Um, a no rise certificate, of course, if it's in the floodway. Uh, less than one foot rise certificate if it's in an A zone. Uh, in an A zone, you can't you you can't cause an unacceptable rise, but um, if it's more than a foot, it's always unacceptable. Now, you know, um, Darcy, you know, you and I have had this conversation before. You can go ahead and say, look, it, where you're at right there. And all of these houses that are close by, I'm not going to let you cause half a foot of rise because it's going to be too much. That might flood somebody's house that's not in the floodplain. But if it's over a foot, it's always too much. Um, and then they sign it. 
And then, of course, once you sign it, it's approved. And, uh, and it becomes a permit. Now, we talked about this class coming on up and all the other permits that are that are that could be required and many of you have said in the eight and a half years i get this question a lot what permits do i need you know d i don't have any idea what you guys are going to be doing you know out where you are i, I don't know if there's a super fun site i don't know what your other regulations are i don't know if the whooping cranes land there every year and whether you have to have some sort of special permit dealing with endangered species I, I don't know what your community would require as far as other permits. Probably a building permit for most of you, but some counties don't even require that. So um, so all of those other permits, any questions? Richard, did I rake you over the coals enough or anything like that? No, 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 no. no okay. I, I, basically, we got to get permits for anything and everything in flowway and in floodplain. Um, which Kelly, my coworker, we working on grading some parking spaces and you gave us a good insight what we need. Yeah. And the cool thing about parking spaces are, you know, in the floodplain and stuff like that, uh, they're pretty easy to get permitted. And, and help me out, Richard, Kelly. Um, I've got a, the cutest little R pod out there in my covered with snow out there in my, in my driveway. Where are you guys building this? Well, it's, it's so it's it basically it's um no we're just uh so what we were doing is we we're filling in like potholes in the existing roads by the soccer fields there at Elkhorn, um because Elkhorn. those dirt road those because around the park there at Elkhorn yeah. Shores, that soccer field area got beat up last fall. Oh, okay. And so yeah. literally we we're just filling it with fill dirt. We didn't know we needed a permit, so what the um get that taken care of um but so we ran into this last fall and this was going to be a question i was going to ask offline but maybe you can talk about that what is it the same form that we need to do for signage things because remember when that road construction project started we got we ran into oh. hassles with where to put our signage so that guests could figure out where to go um gotcha. and there was some discussion about permits is this the same form no, um, this would on, this form is for um, doing development in the floodplain that would cause an obstruction. Okay. So, so if we have this hundred-year flood, you know, if there's a signpost there, that's not going to flood a new neighbor's house. That's not going to knock out the bridge. You know, um, putting a putting a mobile home in there that's not anchored down, flood comes on through. That yeah. mobile home is going to float, you know, and it's going to knock out the county bridge. It needs to be permitted. You know, if, uh, if you're piling up a bunch of dirt to make a new shower house, that that part of the flood water that you're filling in there, that flood water is going to go somewhere else now. And if that floods somebody else's house, then then that's a red flag for the community. So they want to look that on over and say, what's the effect this is going to have if we have this 100-year flood? The signs aren't going to make any difference unless you're putting them down at ground level and you're facing them to just redirect water toward a neighbor you don't like. Yeah. Oh that, no. That, that so is there so is there poles, a <laughs> uh so is there any like if we were to have a sign mounted by our entrance, as long as it's you know off the ground and like is there a permit we need to file with you guys? Well, first off, none of you ever have to permit anything with, with us guys. I mean me guys up at the state. Okay. Um, Elkhorn, who do we got? Do we have anybody here that's from the uh, that would be dealing with that? Doesn't that fall into Omaha now that it was in yeah, Douglas County? Thanks. Okay, because we're dealing with them on the the soft parking variants. That may be something we come back to you on because for years, and I mean years, the ownership yeah. has had to file a variance to the city ordinances because the Omaha city ordinances require paved parking lots, but because we're in that floodway, then we're not supposed to pave it, but gotcha. we have to basically go like, so now this new ownership, I've been dealing with that, um, that 
so I may offline reach out to you to make sure we're covering our bases there because the city, right. the city's now pushing, like, why hasn't this been done? Like, why haven't so it? So are you in the city's jurisdiction or in the county's? It's both, but it's handled by uh, Richard. It's through the Rich. It's through the the city, it, right? The, the oh, city of Omaha is handling the paperwork and they enforcing that. But gotcha. The DNR is following what Omaha insists. Gotcha. Gotcha. So we've been kind of at odds where, like, one set of standards says we can't because it's a floodway build the part, you know, put pave, right. pavement down for the parking lots where the city of Omaha is saying it's a parking lot. It has to be paved. So you want pavement. Oh, and by the way, everybody else here, I will stick around and I will answer your questions and like, but our hour is up and you've answered all three poll questions. I want to thank you so much for being here. You don't have to stick around. If these questions are interesting to you and they're interesting to me, you know, and I've done this for years, um, Feel free to stick around and I'll answer all of your questions uh, that you have as, as we go around. But otherwise, thank you for being here. Thank you for giving me a, an hour of your life. I hope I've made it worthwhile. So, yeah, Kelly, um, Kelly and Richard, like I said, this is all done at the local level. So if the county says we're not going to let you put a paved parking lot next to your soccer field, then... They oh, have it's the oh, they want it. It's vice versa. The it's county this... wants us to pay it. DNR is saying no because we're in the flood okay. wing and flood plain. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, so it's the vice versa. The local level wants to override the state level. Um, and so, okay. like, so, so let's go back to what jurisdiction you're in. Okay. Are you in Douglas County or are you with Omaha? Which jurisdiction? Omaha enforces it for the county. Well, not not enforce. I mean, whose jurisdiction are you in? Who is it that's saying you have to have a pay of parking? Doug, City of Doug, Omaha. It's City, City of Omaha. Omaha. Yeah. Okay. So here's what Robert LaRocco would need from you. And and when you say DNR, I know what you mean, because this is Nebraska. Yeah, and it, it's, it's the whole you're talking NRD. Yeah. It's Lori Lassiter at the NRD. Uh I'm I'm DNR. Me, I am. Okay. Okay. <laughs> NRD. So yes, no, NRD. No, no, no. I, I knew what you meant. I knew what you meant. And so it's Lori Lassiter that's 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 saying, hey, you know, you can't do this. What Omaha's regulations and what Douglas County's regulations are is that if you want to put in and let me just ask you both, do you want to put in a paved parking lot or do you want to have an excuse not to? I think they would have already done it if they could they have. Yeah, not not they. I mean, the ownership. Uh, the, guys, the owners would have done it too. Okay. And our ownership would have done it when they brought bought the property, but because the the various the way it was pretty much taught, explained to our ownership was, everything has to remain portable, and we cannot create any obstructions. So we tried to keep everything in our campground portable so that our right. even our shower house can be moved within an hour like we Good. we set up That's our awesome. office as a mobile office so that it can be moved right. um so That's our under we're talking about the parking lot here right? right but so then they said that basically the 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 ownership was told by nrd that we couldn't pave uh, right. because we wanted to pave the sites we wanted right. to pave the parking lot um and we're told here's how we you couldn't. can do it here's how okay. you can do it if you want to, and that's what I wanted to get at, because okay. if because if the DM, if the NRD is saying no, you can't do it, then you you got to buy out, you know. But I mean, you know, that's, that's a way out to, to not have to pave. But if you want to pave, here's how you do it. You have you you have to hire an engineer. I'm sorry about that, but you have to hire an engineer, and that engineer can say if we paved this parking lot by the soccer field, and if we paved these RV slabs here, 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 and here, it will cause no rise in the floodway. And if he gives you that no rise certificate, Robert LaRocco will sign off and let you do it. Because that's what it takes. That's what it takes to do, to do development in the floodway. And that's what you're saying. Right. It's in the floodway. And so if you have a no rise certificate, 
imagine this. You've got this beautiful area with bushes and some trees, and it's in the floodplain. It's actually in the floodway. So when the floodwaters come, those trees, that underbrush, all that kind of stuff kind of slows down that water and the grass, it all helps to absorb all of that water. Now let's imagine, let's imagine that Walmart wants to come on in and put their Walmart over here and they want to bulldoze all of this out and they want to pave over it. Okay, now when it floods, there's no absorption and that water isn't going to, isn't going to rise. It's going to shoot. It's going to rush through. It's going to be, it's going to be lower, but when it gets to the end of the parking lot, it's getting there that much quicker. And so now beyond the parking lot, now we have a rise because more water is getting there quicker than it used to. It used to be slowed down and everything like that. So a huge parking lot can cause a rise, can cause a 10th of an inch of a rise. That's good information to know because it's, yeah. I mean, like, I mean, I've just been reading the regs, but. And and all the regs say is, is if you've got an engineer that does the calculations and say, hey, this parking lot won't, this parking lot's much smaller than this Walmart parking lot. And it's, it's going to have zero significance on the side. This, this floodway is, you know, half a mile wide. And this parking lot isn't going to have any effect on that at all. Uh, If you have that stamped and signed by an engineer, a no rise certificate, Robert LaRocco should accept that and give you a permit to to pave that. And not just pave that, but probably pave your RV sites too. I think now, again, yeah, I understand. I can't speak for Robert LaRocco. So right. I, would, I would give him a call and I would say, we're looking at getting a no rise certificate so that we can meet your standards here. Is that going to be good enough? We're going to hire an engineer and we're going to get a no rise certificate. And my guess is, knowing their ordinance, uh, that they would accept that. But still, I can't make that decision. Robert no. can. But that information is good information because that's something that um, at least gives us a potential path in the coming, right. you know, in the coming years of okay. that. But you know, we know where to start now and how to start. That's perfect. Thank you. Because we're you learning. I, like we we're always saying that we're trying to learn more about this unique situation that we have michelle i've already lost a bunch of people but as long as i've got all the rest of you here i've had this up on on the on the screen this is our two-day uh floodplain day please please come to it it's going to be a blast um i'm going to be telling at least one sven and Oli joke so that makes it worth your while you know so uh so make sure and attend that and uh and if you don't have, if your community doesn't have the money, talk to Michelle. She she'll she'll get you in a in a a nice was it cobblestone suites. Hopefully, yeah. I hear they're filling up quick. So oh but, oh, let's hope. And, and it is limited to the floodplain administrator for the scholarship. Right. Okay. All right. And and, and, and there is a question in chat if you'd like to cover. Okay. It. I'm going to answer it, but in the meantime, I want to put this screen on up for. Richard and Kelly, just in case you guys are going, hey, we got our question answered. We don't need to stick around for the rest of this. If you need to contact me about anything, uh, there you go. Hey, and Erin's showing her picture. You'll see her name there too. Uh, Her name and number, call her with your most complicated questions. No, (laughs) yeah, Uh, Erin's new. So uh, so I I was throwing her under the bus. Yeah, I was being, don't, don't contact, don't contact her with your most complicated questions but that's her and feel free to contact her contact me contact elijah uh anything like that so uh d i see that you're unmuted did you have a question you've got your hand up yes I oh, do. and you say we've got one in the chat too i will get to the one in the chat right after this sherry kling and smith oh thanks got another meeting stay warm okay i miss sherry okay d okay so you said that Cass County, I'm in Cass County, but I we have our own jurisdiction. Yeah. We're only one right. foot. So right. we're more restricted. Do we have to go by them? No. Okay. That's what I thought. Yeah. Just you checking. are your own jurisdiction. Yeah. Okay. Just yeah. Checking. So, you know, do that as a selling point, you know, tell everybody, hey, aren't you glad you're in our ETJ? Because if you were just on the other side of that line, 
you'd have to bring in another foot of dirt. There you go. Okay, yeah. thanks. And, and they will all love you and send you pies at Christmas time. Well, they do anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Chuck, do you see the question from Darcy or would you need me to read it? Uh, read it to me. You I got it. it. All right, so permit for a 60 by 100 Quonset. Our current map shows the parcel is in the floodplain. The new maps that are currently being worked on on this parcel are is out of the floodplain. Am I, is she saying that they have to use the current map since the new maps are not adopted yet? Right. Do And I think yes. Do you think the parcel yeah. will already be above BFE since the new maps have it out of the floodplain? If we have to use our current floodplain map, they will have to hire a surveyor and find out BFE. If they're one foot above already, they can go ahead and build with a permit. So do they need right. an elevation certificate in all of that as well? Right. Um. So, so Darcy, yeah, very, very good question. Um, and yes, there are new maps that are coming on out. You've needed these new maps for a while, um, but they're not regulatory yet. So I'm sorry, but um, but the regulatory maps, those are the ones that you need to regulate to. And that has them still in the floodplain. Now, because the new maps show them out, do you think that they're gonna be higher than the base flood elevation? Well, you and I both know that's kind of like a roll of the dice, kind of, I mean, you're, you're kind of taking this gamble, but I think it's a pretty good gamble. If the new maps show that they're out, there's a pretty good chance that they're higher than the flood water and they can get it removed. Um, I don't know whether they would get it removed by a Loma or a Loma RF. Uh, Lomas, everybody, is, is a letter of map amendment for uh, for property that's just naturally higher than the floodplain already, flood waters already. Uh, a Loma RF means they brought dirt in and uh, and they changed the grade and then built their quonset on top of it. And so it's not natural grade, it's, it's based on fill. But either one of them would get this removed from the floodplain. The problem would be that uh, with a LOMA, they just apply to FEMA for that. And all they have to do is show that they're higher than the base flood elevation, because that's all FEMA cares about. With a LOMAR F, they have to come to you and get your signature on the community acknowledgement form. And there's a lot of things that that signature means. You know, they're not, they had a permit to bring the fill in. Um, they had a permit to build this in the first place. Uh, all of these other you know, questions like that. Also, they didn't fill in a wetland. They didn't harass any endangered species. And the bottom line is it asks, if they build on this fill, will it be reasonably safe from flooding? Well, it would be difficult to sign off on that unless they at least met the, the minimum of your ordinance, which is a foot higher. So, you know, unless if, if, uh, if it's not natural grade, if they built this on fill, um, and by the way, if that fill came in before 1976, then that's natural grade. Uh, if it came in before your last maps, it's debatable. <laughs> if, it, if it came in before your first maps, it's natural grade. Uh, but uh, but anyway, as, as long as it's natural grade, all it has to do is just be higher than the base flood elevation and they can get it removed. If, if, if it was fill that brought in and they, they built it on top of that fill, you probably aren't going to sign it unless it's a foot higher than the base flood elevation. And then once they're removed, you know, then they can do whatever they want. Darcy, did I answer that one correctly? And I see Dan's got his hand up. This is going to be a good one. You guys won't want to miss this. Well, 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 yeah. Thanks, <laughs> I think what's well, going on here is we've been dealing with a lot of these issues where we have uh, current flood maps in effect for Douglas and Sarpy County, but we have these preliminary maps that are going through the appeal process and waiting for them to be approved. Right. And so today, if there's a proposed development, proposed structure like this case where a 60 by 100 Quonset is being asked to get a permit, 
we were supposed to look at not only the current flood map, but the proposed one. If the proposed one is might be the reverse of what the exit what the situation is here is if it right. shows that it's currently out of the floodplain or the base flood elevation was lower and it's going to be elevated with the new flood map, we have to permit it in it for the for the new map, the higher of the two. Okay. And of course, that requires pre-construction elevations, do a survey on the site, find out what's going on at the ground elevations. What's happening here is the opposite. And just because the future map, which like you said, they are not effective, they're not regulatory at this point, but what's likely happening is the base flood elevation we're seeing is getting lowered in some areas. So the new maps, it's not a matter of the ground being filled or if it's natural, it's that they're actually lowering the BFE because of some flood improvement right. project that's occurred in the past, in the recent years. Right. So they will, unfortunately, there's no guarantee these maps will get approved. So right. FEMA, the regulatory part is we have to hold the current flood based flood. So again, act as if the new maps aren't even there because you know it's going to lessen their impact. Right. Then they have to have an elevation. Now a surveyor should look at both. We would look at both what is the current BFE, what's the future, and we'd let the owner know that, well, when these maps get become effective, we don't know when that is, but your base flood elevation is going to get lowered by two feet, which means you would be two or three feet lower than what you're required to be today. Do you need to build this project now? Can you wait? Or uh, go ahead and build it knowing that you will be out going forward. So that kind of muddies it too, but that's kind of the just what we yeah. do. Yeah, and, and you're you're absolutely right, and 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 um, and that is the ultimate answer to Dar Darcy's question. You know, I think I was the one that muddied the water, but the answer to her question is you have to use the regulatory map that's in place right now. You know, um, you know the the follow up was is you know the thought is is you think they could get it removed from the regulatory map, and and you're right. The the reason that's not on there could be because. We have better LIDAR that shows that the ground was elevated, or it could be that the base flood elevation has gone down, in which case they're going to have to use the base flood elevation, the current regulatory base flood elevation. And that's not going to, that's not going to help. Either way, they have to hire a surveyor and there just aren't too many surveyors any better than Dan Martinez. So if you need a surveyor, Dan is your man. So there you go. Well, Michelle, can we? Uh... Yep. Uh, otherwise, otherwise, we will say goodbye unless anybody has any last minute questions.